Amen, amen. My brothers and sisters, this is an interesting Sunday morning. It is the case with my wife being from California, with me being from Maryland, that normally every holiday season, every Thanksgiving and every Christmas, we are getting on a plane to go somewhere to connect with our families. But this year is different. This year, my family in Maryland has decided not to come together for Thanksgiving because of this coronavirus pandemic. So we will not be traveling. It's the first year, and I don't know how many years, that for safety and for caution, out of an abundance of caution, we will not be gathering together. I certainly will miss being with my parents. My children will miss being with their grandparents. But decisions like these, these are the important decisions that we must make to ensure that we keep persons safe. Both of my parents are seniors. My father, a cancer survivor, it is the wise decision. It is the best decision. I'm glad that they made it. So I'll offer this to you as my church family, that maybe traveling this season isn't the best idea. Perhaps we can come up with new, innovative, and creative ways to connect with family for Thanksgiving and for the holidays. But no matter what you do, I pray that you are safe and that you are full of thanks because our God is worthy of all of the glory. So we prepare to enter into this preaching moment. Look at the thesis verse of the message this morning, if you would, please. Our 10th verse says, do not receive into the house or welcome anyone. Let me say it again. We missed it. Do not receive into the house or welcome anyone. Underline that word, anyone, in your Bible. I'm going to say it a third time to get it into your spirit. Do not receive into the house or welcome anyone who comes to you and does not bring this teaching. For to welcome is to participate in the evil deeds of such a person. Amen. Brothers and sisters, with the help of your prayers and under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, we want to preach to you this morning on the subject of it is okay to have boundaries. It is okay to have boundaries. Providence and our guests all around the world. One of the most common misnomers of the Christian faith is that being a Christian means that you have to be a doormat. People truly believe that. They believe that because we believe in having grace for other people, because Christians believe in offering mercy to the offender, because Luke chapter 6 teaches us to bless those who curse us, to pray for those who despitefully use us, to turn the other cheek when people strike us. Surely that means Christians are personally and emotionally weak. And God has called us to be doormats to those who would mistreat us. And that makes sense, doesn't it? It makes sense that a person would think that. It makes sense that God would want Christians to be doormats. I mean, this is the God who reserved all vengeance for himself. And that God would want his church to be a doormat. This is the God who was so irritated with the evil of this world that he sent a flood and wiped out everybody on the planet save one family. And that God would want you to be a doormat. This is the God who had Moses effortlessly lured the Pharaoh and his Egyptian army into the dry bed of the Red Sea. And then once the Israelites were safely on the other side, he brought down the waters and drowned all of Pharaoh's team simply because they were trying to harm God's manservant. That God would want you to be a doormat. This is the God. The same God who sent the children of Israel into the promised land and told them to kill everything that breathes that was occupying the land. That God would want you just to let the wicked have their way with you. Let, let the wicked just walk all over you. It makes sense that the God we serve, who was attested to in Holy Scripture, that God would want you to be a doormat. E even a cursory reading of Scripture would argue that since you're the head and not the tail, brothers and sisters, I am speaking foolishly, of course. Since you're the head and not the tail, God has no intentions of making you a doormat, nor does God intend to allow the wicked to use you or abuse you for their own selfish purposes. 
And we have to pause parenthetically right there and realize I need not take time in this sermon to specifically identify for you who I am talking about when I refer to as the wicked, because you already know who they are. As soon as I began talking about the wicked who would take advantage of the Christian, thoughts of certain people went running through your mind. And if you are a righteous person seeking to live for God in your life, then you need not have a definition of the wicked provided to you because you already know. And if by chance you can't identify who the wicked are, if you are struggling thinking of who are the unrighteous, who are the wicked, it might be because you are one among them. You need to repent. Scripture teaches us, friends, that we are not to be doormats, but we are also not to behave like the wicked. Write that down and get that in your notes. Put that in your spirit. No, God didn't call you to be a doormat. God did not call you to allow brothers and sisters to walk all over you, but God didn't call you to behave like the wicked either. In the way that the wicked selfishly demean, abuse, and mistreat others, in the way that they use evil speech and their actions and their thoughts, in the way that they manipulate others for their own selfish gain, in the way that they respond to fire with fire, in the way that they take vengeance for themselves, in the way that they lower themselves to the standards of evil, God did not call you to be a doormat, but nor did God call you to behave like the wicked. You are neither a punk nor are you an emissary of Satan, but there is a middle ground between the two. There's a middle ground between being a doormat and behaving just like the wicked. There's a middle ground, and it is on that ground that you will find that the difference between you and the wicked is that God has called you to understand it is okay to have boundaries. Boundaries. The partition, the dividing line, the limits that we place on relationships, that we render the evil nature of the wicked ineffectual because the boundary stops them from doing what they are intending to do to you. And the author of 2 John truly understood this concept of boundaries, and this is what he was trying to minister when he was writing his letter to the house churches in Ephesus. Scholars interpret the history of the purpose of the writing of 2 John to be this way. It is believed that a community of Jewish converts to Christianity were the intended recipients of the letters of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. In 2 John, it is believed that a few people left or broke off from the community to return to their Jewish roots. They effectively rejected Christianity. They turned their backs on the faith. And like most wicked people, a reading of the story would let you know that if they had just left the community of faith, if they had stayed in their own little world promoting their evil amongst themselves, everything would have been all good. But as is unfortunately the case with people who are bitten by the snake of wickedness, they can't be happy unless they bring their drama to you. There were house churches in 2 John where people lived and those who had broken away were coming back to stay in the house. They were coming back to promote their evil in an attempt to tear down the fabric of the faith just that these newly minted Christians might pull away from the faith they had just built up. And you and I should not be surprised by this because wicked people 2,000 years later behave the same way as they did 2,000 years ago. Why is it, I asked myself, that the wicked must always come back and share their negativity with you? Why is it that the wicked leave a relationship and don't stay gone, but they always try to come back? Why, why is it that the wicked have their negative thoughts but need to share their negative thoughts with you? Why is it that people who are unhappy have to post it on Facebook, have to let their Twitter know, have to text you, have to pull you into their foolishness? Why is it? That the wicked are so abundantly sharing their gospel of negativity, more so than the righteous are sharing their gospel of positivity. Why is it that the wicked have to convince you that their way of thinking is right and they obviously can't understand that God allows a multiplicity of ways of thinking until you get to salvation? Why is it that the wicked are always trying to pull us down into their mud? In the epistle, John calls these wicked folks deceivers. Because these are the ones who have denied Jesus. And John, I think, would be okay if they simply denied Jesus and went on about their day. But the interesting thing about these folks is that they denied Jesus and came back to the house of faith to pull other people with them. 
You are the ones who rejected the faith. You are the ones who decided not to walk in the ways of Christ. You are the ones who decided to turn your back on Jesus and decided to turn your spirit away from the cross. Why then are you coming back to the house church to pull other people into your foolishness? Why not just be happy with your own ways of being? Why, why not just be happy with turning your back on Jesus? Why must you proselytize a gospel that pulls other people away from faith? And brothers and sisters, you and I have people like this in our lives. Here you are trying to forgive someone, and there's somebody is telling you you don't need to forgive. Here you are trying to speak calmly to someone, and there's somebody is trying to get you to turn up. Here you are trying to love your neighbor, and there's someone is telling you that you can hate other people. Why is it that the wicked must always try to pull you into their foolishness. Notice what John's biblical teaching is to them. Those who think that you are supposed to be a doormat in the faith, those who think that you are simply supposed to go their way, you would think that John would simply tell the church to humbly accept them back because that's what Christians do. You would think John would tell them, turn the other cheek, forgive the wicked, reestablish relationship with them. You would think that John would tell them, put up with the mess of their evil down here because of the hope and glory of being in God in heaven up there. You would think that John would tell you to piously fall to your knees and, and let the wicked have their way because surely to be a Christian is to be a doormat. Surely to be a Christian is to go with whatever is necessary. You would think that's what John would teach them. But look closely at the 10th verse, brothers and sisters, now that I've given you the context of the epistle. Verse 10 says, and I quote, do not receive into the house or welcome anyone who comes to you and does not bring this teaching. Look at it closely. I think you missed it in the text. He says, do not receive them or welcome anyone. And then he gets worse. In verse 11, he gets real bold. He says, and if you do you are participating in the evil deeds of such a person. Wow. That is some really powerful stuff. Now look closely at the text. He doesn't say argue with them. He doesn't say fight with them. He doesn't say fight fire with fire. He doesn't say curse them out or mistreat them. He doesn't say battle them or go to war with them. He simply says do not engage with them. He simply says, don't receive them and welcome them. Don't engage. In other words, what he's saying very gently, brothers and sisters, is that in the presence of the wicked, put up a boundary where if they won't leave you alone, you have the faith and the good sense to leave them alone. This is really instructive, brothers and sisters, because 90% of the wicked people who are in your life are in your life because you are putting up with them. 90% of the wicked people who are in your life are in your life because you have not put up a boundary to put them in their proper place in your life. A lot of what we are experiencing from the wicked has to do with the fact that we are engaging with the wicked. You don't like what a politician is saying? Why are you have your TV on that channel? You don't like what somebody has posted on Facebook? Why are you on their page? You don't like what somebody is saying on your phone? Why are you still in the conversation? Uh, you don't like how your boyfriend or girlfriend is acting? Why are you still in the relationship, baby? I'm trying to tell you that the reason that the wicked get so much airtime in our lives is because we have lowered our standards of who we will engage with in this life. John said, I said what I said, and I'm not playing. Don't let them back in the house church, he says. This seems harsh until you look at how he described them. This boundary isn't for everybody in your life. Be specific. This boundary John offers is for anyone who does not bring the teaching you have received. In other words, the wall goes up, watch this, if they are promoting a different gospel than the one you received and... You see the and, the connecting conjunction? Write it down. And you know you're, you're young in the faith and you are not able to resist being pulled into the foolishness with them. This is key here, brothers and sisters, and most people miss this in the text. Realize that John was writing to new Christian converts who hadn't been walking with the Lord for decades. He was writing to people whose faith was not tried and true. He was writing to people whose faith was not tested and proven. And for a babe in Christ, John knew that they had to be protected at all costs, which is why significant boundaries had to go up. The reason is because babies must be protected. We must have boundaries for them. Here it is. 
If you can be honest in your life, then no matter how old you are or how long you've been walking with Christ, if you can identify the areas of your faith where you are still a baby in Christ, if there is a wicked person in your life who is tapping on that area where you are a babe in Christ, and you know that they are going to pull you away from the teachings that you have received, John is saying that wall needs to go up and they need not be in your space. You've got to be honest, brothers and sisters, this morning about the faith, the areas of your faith that is not fully matured, the, the areas of your life where you know God is still working on you and developing you, then it is okay to have strong boundaries because God wants to protect your faith. This, brothers and sisters, is not a teaching for you to cut folks off or kick, folk, kick folks out of your life. This is about having an honest spiritual assessment of your faith, a true understanding of self, a real emotional and spiritual intelligence that admits I cannot handle having this person in my life. I cannot handle what this person is trying to bring into my life. I cannot handle where this person is trying to take me. And for the favor of staying in right relationship with God, I can not have them pass my boundary. Pause right there. You hear how I said it? I said I cannot handle what this person is bringing. And in the moment that I said I cannot handle what this person is bringing, some of you got real crunk with the TV. You said, oh, pastor, I can handle them. If God would just let me handle it the way I want to handle it, if God would just let me talk to them sideways, let me them talk to them crazy, let me just act foolish, then the wicked wouldn't come to me wicked anymore. And this is exactly the point that John is trying to make. If you know, brothers and sisters, that the only way you know how to engage with the wicked is to become one of them, then God would rather you put up a boundary than you get pulled into the foolishness. If you know that their darkness is going to put out your light, if you know that their evil is going to steal your joy, if you know that their heresy is going to change your gospel, if you know that their lives are going to overshadow your truth, their ignorance is going to pull you down and keep you down, then you have got to put up boundaries in your life. Uh, because just as we protect babies, uh, we don't even bring them out of the house for the first few weeks because we want them to grow and get stronger and be better to able to handle the germs of this world. Uh, then John is telling the church and I am telling you uh, you must protect your emotional and spiritual integrity against the germs of this world uh, if you know that if you receive this person into your house if you know if you hang out with this person if you know that if you spend time with this individual if you know that if you date this individual if you know that if you move forward with this individual that you are going to become just like them talking like them acting like them and doing the things that they do the Bible says it is better not to engage than to violate the tenets of your faith. No friends. You do not have to engage. You don't have to put them in their place. You don't have to recompense evil for evil. You don't have to show them who they're dealing with or make them realize who they are talking to. All of that is spiritually unnecessary. What you do have to do is realize that in this life it is okay to have boundaries. Uh, it is okay to realize that there are some people that you just aren't mature enough to deal with yet. Listen, I, I've been walking with the Lord for a little while now. I, I'm a pastor of a church uh, and I can admit there are some folks I am not mature enough to handle. Uh, baby, it is better for me to put up a boundary and stay away from you because you might pull me into some stuff I ain't got no business being pulled into. John is not arguing about the evil of the wicked. In the text, when you read it closely, John is protecting the faith of the righteous. Brothers and sisters, it is okay, perfectly okay, for you to have boundaries in your life simply because without these boundaries, you and I become double-minded. When you're around Christians, you act like a Christian. But when you're around the wicked, you act like the wicked. And we can't tell what type of person you are because you are double-minded, because your faith isn't strong enough to stay with Jesus at all times and in every way. It is okay to have boundaries so that you can walk in the ways that Jesus would have you to walk. And then, here it is, so that you can grow stronger in the faith. You see, just because you have a boundary that they can't come into the house, just because you have a boundary that you can't date to them, just because you have a boundary that you can't spend time with them, just because that is a boundary today does not mean that that is going to be a boundary always. It means that today I'm not ready 
But as I mature and grow in the faith, as I get stronger in my relationship with Jesus Christ, as I grow and allow the Holy Spirit to use me soon and very soon, the day is coming when my light is going to overshadow your darkness, when my goodness is going to overshadow your evenness, when my righteousness is going to overshadow what you are trying to pull away from me. And on that day, baby, you better get ready. Because that is the day I transform the wicked into the righteous. That is the way I turn the evil into the good. That is the time I pick up those who are down and bring them up. And I shine the light of the world and the salt of the earth all over you that you are compelled to come home to Jesus Christ. That day is coming. Our God is that good. The church is that powerful. But if you're not there yet, it is okay, perfectly okay, to have boundaries in your life. God bless you, Providence.